Uh, welcome to GlugNet. Uh, tonight we are going to be discussing application architecture and scalability. A couple housekeeping items. This meeting is being recorded, so if you're uncomfortable sharing your face in the recording, feel free to turn your camera off. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> or not, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, with when the presentation is going, if you could please stay muted unless you are going to ask a question or our speaker, Matt, has posed a question to us. That way there's less background noise and we can all hear the presentation. Uh, there's also a chat feature that we you can drop your comments in if you don't feel comfortable piping up. We'll monitor that and interject as those come in. At the conclusion of our presentation, we will have a survey to give Matt some feedback, it's all anonymous, but it goes to making sure uh, future presentations meet the needs and such. So I'll, a link will be put in the chat at the end of the presentation, please fill that out. And Matt, I will get that those results to you in a day or two after it closes. Uh, in addition, there's a JetBrains license giveaway tonight for eligible participants who fill out the survey. Uh, that entitles you to one free perpetual license for a product of your choice, gives you updates for a year. And at that point, you can either pay to keep the license up to date or just use the version you land on. So it's a great deal. Uh, sponsors this evening, obviously JetBrains because of the uh, license they're giving away and NIS Technologies who is providing this meeting space for us. So thank you to both companies for that. Our speaker this evening, Matt Eland, is committed to helping people achieve greater things. After our three decades of coding, Matt left active development to become an instructor at Tech Elevator where he helps understand the fundamentals of programming while holding on to the things that make programming fun. Matt writes on software development at killalldefects.com and is building side.dev, a free online social project management application for individual developers pursuing side projects. Take it away, Matt. All right, thanks for having me. Um, I trust you can see my screen and uh, and hear me, et cetera. Um, yes. But uh, please let me know if you can't. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm an instructor at Tech Elevator. Um, we are, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about us in a second. Um, but uh, some things you should know about me, uh, I've been working in the software as a service industry for about 20 years now, primarily with .NET technologies and uh, JavaScript as well. Um, it's kind of relevant for my uh, talk today. So uh, do a lot of helping organizations grow from you know, being very small to, to offering their products and scaling up to a, a larger size, getting acquired, getting reacquired, uh, that kind of a thing, uh, typically with .NET technologies and, uh, and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm an organizer down at the uh, Central Ohio .NET uh, developer group in uh, Columbus. Uh, and uh, it's, it's nice to be talking at another .NET group. Uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, about Tech Elevator. Um, Tech Elevator is a 14-week programming boot camp. Uh, we operate mostly in the in northeastern United States, but we're really branching out to more of a, a, a national live remote kind of a thing, uh, including a few virtual communities in specific areas uh, uh, throughout throughout the uh, United States. Uh, sorry, I forgot to turn on my laser pointer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we teach Java or C Sharp. Um, we teach databases, ASP.NET or Spring Boot if you're on the Java side. We teach really full stack development, including uh, Vue.js as a, as a front end framework. Uh, it's really a, a very quality program, which is why I was so tempted to, to leave development and join and invest in our students. Um, Whenever I talk, I tend to give about three different types of talks. The first type of talk is I am trying to get you motivated. I'm trying to get you excited about something. I'm, you know, I, I'm trying to light some sort of a fire, right? The second kind of a talk is more of a, hey, how do I build something? How do I do something very specific? How do I write an X unit test? How do I create a new uh, web API? How do I get started with Dapper? Something like that, right? Uh, the third type of talk I give 
is more of what I would call a, a, a toolbox talk, where I'm showing you a lot of different approaches uh, for things, but not going into depth on really any of them. My goal is to try to help people understand uh, what's available to them and uh, giving them things to research if they wanted to, to learn more. Uh, and that's really where we are today. So my goals for today, uh, I'm gonna be happy if you come out of this with more comfort and you're able to talk to people more intelligently about uh, application architecture, scalability, things like that. Um, I want to give you a few more things to investigate uh, in more detail, especially some of these more emerging things or more advanced things. Uh, and I also wanna give you some words of caution about some of, the, some of those more advanced things. Uh, because as we know in software, everything has trade-offs and uh, new things are good uh, until they're not. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but these are kind of my goals for you is for you to, to see things at a higher level uh, and to have a few more things to investigate and, and maybe know how to get started with that. So our structure today, uh, we're gonna start off with some core concepts related to applications and scalability, et cetera. Uh, and then we're going to dive right into this, the, the nut of, of scalability. And we're going to look at a bunch of different aspects of that. We're going to be looking at how do we scale the web server or the, uh, the application server? How do we scale our database, uh, web APIs? Because there's some special considerations I feel that we need to talk about with APIs. We need to talk about a little bit about some front end scalability concerns. And then we'll close with some kind of advanced concepts, including discussions of microservices and things like that. Uh, at the very tail end, I'll talk to you about kind of my own recommendations for scalability uh, and, and just how, uh, how you can get started and things like that. Um, I do get paid uh, to get inter interrupted, and so I do encourage you to, uh, to chime in and chat uh, with questions, et cetera. Uh, if somebody would monitor that for me and maybe chime in and unmute yourself, I, I would be uh, very thankful. Uh, but please do interrupt with questions. Uh, it's going to be a lot easier to ask questions as you have them. Uh, versus trying to remember everything for the end, uh, because I'm going to be covering a lot of ground and, and moving around a, a lot from topic to topic. Uh, one note on that, um, I can be a generalist in many areas. There's some things here today that I'm a specialist on and some things that I, I know very little about and haven't even played with. But my goal is to give you kind of a more complete uh, picture of things. So I may not be able to answer every question you throw at me, and, and that's okay. Um, but let's look at some core concepts. So I'm talking today primarily about web applications. And with, with a web application, you have some sort of a client, so something that's running on a user's machine. This is gonna be your Chrome browser or uh, your mobile device. Uh, potentially this might be a desktop application or a mobile application. Uh, but for the majority of, of, of discussion today, we'll just say that it's a web application. And this is something that's, that's running on your, your machine and it's gonna be making calls out uh, to a web server using some sort of a communication protocol. So that server has some form of an API. It's an application programming interface. It's a way for, for uh, other things to talk to your server via, a, uh, via the signature that you've defined that other people can interact with your application, right? And your server is gonna be doing something. It's gonna be figuring out how to handle that request and spit back a response that your client application can do something with. It might be getting a list of, of data and so, you, so you can display that in the screen or uh, handling when the user clicks buy. And often when we're handling requests like this, we'll need to talk to a database. And typically that's, that's done uh, via SQL queries when we're working with a relational database. We will be talking primarily about relational databases today. Uh, there is a moment in our database segment where we'll talk a little bit about NoSQL databases, but uh, if it's unclear, I will be mostly talking about database servers uh, or, or relational databases today. Um, so that's kind of what's going on there. So this kind of a three-tier architecture is really uh, what we've, we've gotten used to over the last decade or two, uh, though that's changing a little bit with the advent of microservices. But let's talk more about what a server actually is. So traditionally, a server is going to be some little rack mounted blade kind of a thing sitting in a data center somewhere. It might be your data center. If you're a large company, it might be something downtown. Um, but a server is something that lives uh, uh, that lives in a data center, or <laughs> if you're a really small organization, it might live in your back closet. I've, I've seen that before. Um, but it lives somewhere and it runs your application and it's connected to the internet and things can talk to your server over the network or the internet 
and they'll make a request and they'll get a response. When we're doing a, a, a Google search, we're making a call out from our browser that goes to some massive rack of servers that Google has and it, it handles your request and it spits back some results. So typically when we talk about a server, we're talking about that. So if you ever want, needed a new server, you have to buy a new piece of hardware. You have to configure it. You have to configure the operating system. You have to install it, make sure it's connected to the network. There's a lot of operational overhead. You have to install security updates as things come available. That's sort of the traditional server model. Uh, that was kind of hard and expensive to deal with. And so we, uh, the IT professionals, which I wouldn't really, uh, I'm not a server admin or operations kind of a guy. Like this is not my, my forte. But they moved on to kind of a, a more virtualized server model where they have a really big server that's, that's hosting something called a hypervisor. And this hypervisor lets it run virtual machines inside of this, this, this server. So you got one really big, powerful server, and that server might be running a single instance of Windows or Linux or something. And it might have my app on here, and it might have my coworker's app on another operating system. And it's giving each one of these little guest operating systems a portion of its, of its memory, a portion of its processor power a portion of whatever. So we have a really big, powerful server who can handle, let's say eight to 10 or whatever it might be, different operating systems and their, and their, their needs. And as an, as an application grows, you give it a little bit more of the resources from, from that server. Uh, so we don't have to worry as much about hardware. We still have to, to do some hardware maintenance. We still have to do um, security updates on these operating systems, but it's a little easier to manage. Um, and then this thing called Docker came around and containerization came around. And what we said was, hey, we've got, we've got this guest operating system and this is Linux and this is Linux and this is Linux. And oh my goodness, we have so much space resorted to all these, these operating systems. Well, why do we need to, to, to keep Linux around on all three of these machines? Why can't we just rely on, on uh, one server that has kind of shared dependencies and it got, has kind of a standard um, configuration? So we define our app not as a as a operating system, but as a container that says, hey, I need some some sort of a Linux environment. I need some sort of a Linux environment. I need some sort of a Linux environment and the .NET framework and whatever, right? And so it's it, it lets the same hardware host a little bit more because it's it's having to do less with operating system maintenance. It's having to do less with storage and memory and, and the like. So our, hard, our, our hardware is now able to do a little bit more with containerization. It's also a little bit more repeatable and, uh, and and all these good things. Like we can we can predict the way our application is going to run because I can run a container on my machine and then I'll, I'll switch the send it off to operations and they'll run it on a server and they'll they'll give it maybe different configuration files or configuration settings and it'll act a little bit differently. But it, it it's it's a little easier to test as well, which is nice. Uh, and then finally. Instead of using virtual machines and containers that we control, um, the advent of cloud computing lets us use data centers controlled by AWS or Azure or Google or somebody else. And these are things that we no longer have to worry about the hardwares, uh, the hardware involved. We no longer have to worry about the, the cooling and the uh, HVAC and the backup power supplies and things like that. We don't have to worry about data center security anymore. We are now, giving that responsibility to Microsoft or Amazon or somebody else, and they are monitoring it for us. They're giving us access to a virtual machine or a place to put a Docker container or some sort of a, what we call a product as a service offering where we can just push our ASP.NET Core application up and it just runs on somebody else's machine. So they're taking care of all of the, uh, all these other things and we can just worry about our application. It also gives us a little bit more scalability. Um, so this is sort of how the term of a server has evolved uh, over the last couple decades. Um, but with these terms out of the way, I'm going to get, get into more about uh, scalability. I like stories uh, and I like Reddit. So I'm going to be telling you a story today about a fictitious organization called Bereddit. Uh, this is a startup who decided that their whole reason to, to exist is to create a Reddit clone that only deals in burrito related con content. Um, they've hired a crack team of moderators to remove any uh, non burrito content from their platform. They've hired some wonderful software developers to build an ASP.NET 
core application that can host all this stuff. And they've hired some great marketers to increase the daily active user count. And they're hoping that someday they'll turn a profit, but right now they're just trying to get more and more people to use the application. Um, and they're succeeding on all fronts. The, they have the features they need, uh, only posts about burritos are, are going in, people apparently really like burritos, uh, and they're starting to get a lot more users. And with the, uh, with the uh, addition of users, they're starting to get a little bit more about uh, performance issues. So pages are slower to load. They're getting occasional error messages showing up. They are uh, occasionally having pages just entirely time out and customers are starting to complain. Users are starting to use the system less. Uh, and that's a problem because they want uh, more people to have access to burrito related social media, uh, which apparently is a thing. Uh, and so the first thing that they do uh, is the first thing that you should do, which is don't just make a guess as to what's slow. You want to, to actually do some measurement and figure out what's going wrong. Um, and you can use what are called application performance monitoring or APM tools uh, to monitor your application's performance. If you're using a cloud provider uh, such as uh, Breddit is, uh, is using uh, uh, Azure, um, they'll have a nice little dashboard that you can look at. You can say, okay, well, am I getting requests that completely fail or error out? How is my server response time doing over time? Are we getting more requests over time or less requests over time? Are we having any availability issues? Is it, like, what's what's the the health of my server at a glance, right? Uh, so you can get a nice little dashboard and see, okay, what's the data telling us about this problem? Okay, people are using it less. We're having some spikes and things. We're having some failures. What's going on? And you can drill a little deeper with these tools, and you can look at, at things. You can see, okay, well, what area are these problems occurring in? Uh, and, and you can get even little little uh, peaks into things and say, okay, well, where are most of my time? Where's most of my time being spent here? Um, and you can can look at things. That, let's say, okay, is it is it kind of across the board, or is it more in a, a certain area of the application? Uh, are we getting a lot of requests for a certain certain URL? You know, the more data you can get about where things are going wrong, the the more accurate you can be as you're trying to improve your performance. Um, so one of the things you can do with that is you can drill into any one of these slower requests with an APM tool and you can see a little bit more about, uh, about what's going on. So this is sort of a, a sample request and we might look and see where's all my, uh, all my time going. Um, don't worry about the specifics of the screenshot, um, but you can look at something like this and you can say, Hey, I'm spending a lot of my time in the .NET code. So maybe my server is overloaded, maybe my code is slow, uh, maybe my code is inefficient, something like that. Um, here's a screenshot from another application. If you don't happen to be running your code in the cloud, you can use something like uh, uh, New Relic, um, which actually lets you uh, install this application onto your, uh, onto your, onto your, uh, uh, your server, and you can actually look at a graph of the performance over time. And this will even give you a nice pretty view where blue is .NET code, yellow is uh, SQL Server, uh, green would be uh, external API calls, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can kind of at a glance see, where's all my time going? You know, our, oh, we're spending a lot of time in .NET code. Oh, we're having some, some, some errors over here. Oh, we're having some, some issues and it's all related to this page. Um, and you look at this data and you say, okay, I think I know what's going on. It looks like my server can't handle the load that it's under. And so we're spending a lot of time in here. A server is slow. Let's see what we can do to improve the code or improve the server. But the key point here is use your tools to figure out what's going wrong with your server before you try to fix things. Because you could be trying to fix the wrong thing. You could be making it worse. You want to measure before and you want to measure after to make sure that you're actually improving things. But let's say that Beretta has done its measurements and they've determined that their web server is the issue. That's usually the first thing that, that an organization is going to have problems with is their web server. Um, and the easiest way of resolving issues with a web server performance is to scale that up. Usually you'll start at a really small server, um, something very affordable for a startup. And as you start getting a lot of concurrent users for the first time, you start to notice things are slow. And the easiest way to restore service is to pay for a better machine. So you're scaling up, you're scaling vertically. So uh, we're, we're, if we're maintaining the server ourselves, we're adding memory to it, or we're, we're 
replacing the, the box entirely with something with a better processor, um, or maybe op upgrading a disk drive, something like that. Um, if we're hosted on Azure or some other cloud provider, uh, they will give you uh, an option to choose from what type of a server you want. So we could move from a really cheap server to something with a little bit more memory or things like that. And they'll tell you a little bit more about their, their pricing. Um, the downside of this is that uh, you're paying more. Uh, you're, you're paying for the hardware you're buying or you're paying for the server that you're effectively renting uh, from your cloud computing provider. Uh, it's usually worth it early on to scale up because it's usually not that much of a cost increase. Um, but if you have to double your server every so often, that does become a problem and you start to need to, to, to look at uh, better alternatives for scalability than that, if that makes sense. Um, but there's another problem with this, with just always scaling up your server, because we don't get the same level of traffic throughout the day. Uh, usually organizations will have peak hours. So between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., you might get a lot more uh, traffic than you do at other points in the day. So 3 p.m. we have a whole lot of traffic in, in terms of number of requests going to our server versus 3 a.m. it's it's pretty dead. The problem with scaling up our servers is because is, is we're paying for the same level of power across the day. We need enough power to handle our highest peak and then a little bit of wiggle room. But if we're just running on one server and we're making it a really good one, we still are paying the same amount uh, of, uh, of money per hour uh, at the off-peak hours. The other problem with, with scaling vertically is that whenever we scale up or down, we actually take our application offline for a little bit while another server gets spun up or we add or remove memory or whatever it might be. But the application becomes unavailable. And so it's something you have to sort of do during off hours if you're, if you're doing some sort of an adjustment to your server. Unless it's an emergency, nobody can access your site, and you're like, whatever, we're going to double the, the the processor power of our machine. At that point, and I've seen that happen, it's usually okay to take down your server because nobody can use it anyway. Uh, but that's more of an emergency situation. Um, so obviously, scaling up has its limitations. Um, and so we want to look instead at scaling out after a certain point. So scaling out is instead of having one really big server, we now have a number of smaller servers. And these you know, are still our cheaper servers, but we have them inside of something called a load balancer. And this load balancer has a pool of servers available to it. And as a request goes in from a web application uh, to, to our, our server, it's talking to the load balancer. And the load balancer keeps track of which one's next. And it says, okay, the next healthy server is gonna get this request. Okay, and then it goes to this one, and then this one, and then back to this one. And it's sort of distributing them evenly. And so now we have a lot of little servers helping out with the same level of load. And so we don't we can pay for the cheaper servers and they're able to keep up. The really nice thing about this approach is that we can add and remove servers as we need to. So we can tell the server that it's no longer part of the load balancer. The load balancer no, no longer gives it, gives it future requests. And, it's, and then, we, then uh, Azure will power down our server and we stop paying for it. And this gives us um, what we call elasticity. So elasticity lets us scale the number of servers that we have here in orange uh, based on the traffic that we have. So in the off-peak hours, we're running one server. And then as we start getting more usage, we add two and then three and four, and in our peaks, we're adding five. Um, and so this lets us pay for exactly what we need. So we're paying for cheaper servers and we're only paying for the servers when we need them. I, I hate charts with two legends, but this is the best way I've found <laughs> of representing this data so far. So apologies for this graph. That's the best one I have so far. Um, so this is elasticity, and this is one of the huge advantages of horizontal scalability, uh, is that we can add and remove servers. It takes a little bit for a new server to come online and go offline, but we have that, that level of elasticity that we need, and we're no longer paying for the really huge servers um, all the time. Um, cool thing about this is we can set this up uh, typically with rules. We can either manually say, hey, I need four servers right now and just click a button and it'll add them. Or we can say, hey, at 8 a.m. I need three servers. Or we can say when the CPU percentage on all of our servers is over 70%, we need to add another server. 
up to my maximum limit of five servers that I've configured. Uh, this is just an example case. And when the when our average server utilization is below 35%, let's say, we'll decrease our count of servers down to our minimum of one. And so this lets us configure rules that we're comfortable with, uh, with from a pricing perspective to automatically handle scalability for us. This is one of the advantages that we get from cloud computing. This is a screenshot from Azure. Uh, but uh, these, are, these same concepts are gonna occur in AWS and in uh, uh, Google Cloud and uh, potentially other providers, uh, is this automatic scalability. So that is the, uh, the server side of things. I'm gonna pause for a drink and for, for questions if there are any. Before we yeah, talk about the database for you, please. Uh, so when you have uh, auto scalability, and mm -hmm. the, the, so you have mentioned that whenever we change the servers, as far as uh, scalability, that there's a little bit of downtime. So if you have it set to auto scale out, um, how much downtime are we looking at there? So with horizontal scalability, you're not looking at any, uh, which is really cool because what happens is the load balancer knows that the new server that the server is going offline. So it stops routing requests to it before it actually goes offline. Um, or if we're adding a new server, it lets it start up and get ready before it adds it to the load balancer. Um, so with horizontal uh, horizontal scalability, we're, we're actually not introducing downtime at all, which is really cool. It's only with vertical scalability. Does that help? Oh, very much, thank you. Mm -hmm. And please uh, interrupt with questions, I, I love it. Um, so let's talk about uh, Beretta. They're they're doing great somehow. I don't know how that's a viable business model, but we'll say they're doing great. Uh, they're continuing to scale up, which is awesome. Um, but now they're starting to have performance issues again. And so they measure things in their application performance monitoring tool, and they look again and they say, okay, well, our servers are fine, but now we're having some issues at the database level. And the reason they're having issues at the database level is because with horizontal scalability, even though we might be getting 43 requests a second or some arbitrary number and splitting them evenly between our servers, those servers are all still talking to the same database. And so they're all still making you know, X number of queries per request and they're all going to that same database. And at a certain point, that's going to be more than this database server can handle. So the first solution to this is the same that we had with our server scalability uh, concern we scale up our database server. We use a, a, a larger tier of database. Um, we get a server with, with a better, little bit better uh, hard drive. So we're usually we're looking at moving from uh, normal hard drives to solid state drives or from normal solid state drives to premium solid state drives. Whatever we can do to make the disk speed faster, uh, whatever we can do to store more in RAM, uh, whatever we can do to, to process things. Uh, the problem is this is even more expensive than scaling up the uh, the application server. Is is now we we have to deal with the disk space concerns and having a really large and really fast uh, hard drive, and that gets expensive pretty quickly. Um, so usually you can't scale up the database that much because it becomes very hard to justify from a business uh, cost perspective. So once you start to get a, a, enough sustained usage, you start to find that you need to worry about um, what your database is doing or what your application is doing with the database rather. Um, and so while a startup, a brand new startup might not need to worry that much about the way their queries are working, except in extreme cases, uh, once you hit a certain stage with a relational database, you need to start spending regular time looking at queries, looking at Okay, well, what's slow? What's taking the most time? Usually there's a table or two that take up the most, uh, the majority of your uh, of your performance issues with the database. And it's usually because there's not a, a good index on those tables or or your query is, uh, is not hitting the proper index. I don't want to go too deep into database indexes in this talk, um, but usually you'll have to spend some sort of ongoing period of time every month or every sprint or something like that or every other sprint doing some sort of database optimization and query optimization. So making sure you have the right indexes, making sure your, your queries are tuned to hit those indexes properly, um, things like that. Uh, so you, so this, this tends to be part of the ongoing life of an organization. And at a certain point, you need to hire a database engineer or a database administrator 
which is not something that a, a small organization typically has. Um, but as you grow, you often need this. Uh, you may ask yourself why we're not scaling out if, if that was a solution of the server side before. Um, the reason is because it, let's say that we are uploading a picture of a burrito, right? And the load balancer sends it to a random server. Let's say it sends it to server three. It inserts that picture into that database server, okay? Let's say I say, hey, hey, honey, check out this this picture I uploaded. And she goes to, to beredit.com. Don't go there, I don't know what's there. Um, it hits the load balancer. It takes her to the app server one. And she says, well, honey, I, I don't see it. I, it's not there. Or worse, it's a picture somebody else uploaded, right? Uh, so we really can't uh, do horizontal scalability like this where every server has its own database. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, instead, we have to rely on something called partitioning or sharding, um, where we take a really big database and we split it into smaller databases. Uh, for example, if I was running an organization that did software as a service and I had a lot of different customers, I might choose to partition my database so that customers with uh, names of A to E are in one database and F to M are in another database and N to Z are in another database. Whatever makes the most sense and splits it, the, splits it evenly. Um, and that way when a customer comes in and they want to get their data, the application says, oh, okay, well, well, you're with Fabricam. All right, well, well, I'll query this database for you. Um, this is typically a lot of work to set up if you're not planning for it. Um, it's a really good solution for doing uh, larger scale database operations for an organization that's growing, um, but this requires a lot of engineering effort and planning. There are some database technologies that do allow this kind of thing with less effort, um, but I am definitely not a database guy. I, I, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I do know that some of the more some of the more recent uh, database technologies can allow you to do some of this stuff automatically uh, with with database technologies. But in older things, older applications, this is something that you're going to have to spend a lot of engineering time around. An alternative to this is to to look at NoSQL. Uh, NoSQL is a different type of database. Uh, I don't like the name NoSQL, but it's stuck. Um, these are different ways of storing things. With the relational databases, they're really good at querying things. They're really good at enforcing uh, rules, so schemas. Uh, they're really good at enforcing relationships, making sure that I can't insert a city into a city's database for uh, that, that corresponds to a state that doesn't exist, for example. They have a lot of this sort of built-in stuff. NoSQL says, you know what? Um, nah, it's fine. We don't need that level that level of of control typically. Um, there's about four different types. We're going to look at each type in turn, uh, just very briefly. Uh, the first type would be a key value database. This is like a .NET dictionary, where you have a uh, a some sort of a unique key to identify a value, and the database just stores the value. And that value could be a string, could be a number, could be some piece of JSON, XML, whatever it might be. It really is like a database built around a dictionary uh, or, or a map if you're not from a .NET background, but we're at a .NET group, so we'll say it's a dictionary. Um, this, the second type of, of NoSQL database that you hear about, and this is the one you hear about the most, is a document database. A document database is very much like a key value database, uh, except it's more built for uh, these kinds of, of things. So you, it's more built for JSON. Um, we're still not really validating a whole lot of what's going on. Some of these technologies do allow validation and do allow some sort of limited queries and joins and things like that. Um, but it's not the same level of what you'd see in a relational database. Um, document databases typically let you put in whatever you want or something pretty close to what you want. Um, so you're responsible, you're more responsible for making sure your data is valid because the database does less checking for you. Uh, the, the benefits of this is that uh, it scales up better. A lot, all the stuff uh, with NoSQL tends to scale uh, out a lot better just out of the box. Um, so that's one of its many advantages, but it has disadvantages as well. Um, another uh, kind of database that you see is a column family database or a wide column database, it's sometimes called. Uh, and this is more of a tagging kind of a thing where you have a table that has rows 
but those rows have different columns from one, one another, uh, potentially. So this is really good for if you need to add ad hoc values to things and have things somewhat kind of related to each other, but not fully related to each other. Um, it's interesting. I've never played around with this, but uh, that's sort of the idea of a column family or wide column database. Uh, the last one is the one that interests me the most, and that is a graph database. Think about a social network like LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, you're going to have vertices or nodes representing some piece of data, whether it's a task or a user or a project or something like that. And those are going to have edges or relationships uh, to, uh, to one another, right? And so um, this, this, this guy might have some sort of a... Uh, a link to say they follow this other user and that user might follow them back um, in a in a graph like LinkedIn or, or or Facebook or something like that it might be oh uh, well this person's my sister this person's my husband that kind of a thing uh, or I worked with this person so you can have data on these edges you can have custom labels on these edges and you can have data on each of these nodes this is really good for uh, things that need to produce recommendations so hey you might know Sue because several of your friends know Sue or things like that. That's sort of what graph databases are good for. All right, that is our database aspect. I'm going to rehydrate myself and make room for questions because I think I saw one just come in. Uh, yeah, Matt, we just had one in the chat asking if you have any documentation for the column family tables. I do not. Uh, I am a NoSQL noob. Um, I, I'm definitely not a database guy, um, and that's been a growing area for me as I look into these things. Um, I do not. I'm sure there are people here in chat who might have better things to recommend, though, and I would be interested to see what they have to recommend, but I, I don't have a lot to point you at, unfortunately. Uh, aside from a book recommendation, whoop, for a book that I've not Is read. The column family one, a, uh, is that like Sandra? Is that kind of, kind of database? Is that the type, you know? Say the question again, I'm sorry. Uh, like for a column family database, just understand like what is like a brand, you know, is it Cassandra? Is that like one of those or is that different? Yeah, I think Cassandra is the most famous column family. Okay. So I use Dynamo and it's family. like a variant. Of, it was both off of that Dynamo paper, I think it is, but Dynamo DB on AWS. And um, to me, it's like I just save a JSON document, but then ends up saving it across, kind of like you said, like you know whatever columns you have, um, mm. puts those in there. But but I thought that there's like other ones called column nerd databases, I think they call them, or something like that. It's the same thing, yeah. where it groups the data by column, I think. <laughs> so I think it's like something different. But I'm still trying to learn myself about a lot of that. So the better. book recommendation I have is uh, no sequel for more for mere mortals. It looks wonderful. I've not had a chance to fully read it yet as I knocked over a bunch of dog treats and while my dog was helping himself over there. All right, Jester, happy happy birthday, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so that's databases. Let's talk a little bit about, oh, uh, one last thing I wanna mention because we're at, at, this is a .NET group, which is awesome. Um, Microsoft has uh, something called Cosmos DB, which has all four of these APIs built into it. You have to pick one when you're creating a new Cosmos DB instance, but it can do any one of these four plus a standard SQL interface. And it's a distributed, they call it a premium database. And uh, yeah, the pricing is a little premium too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that that's something to consider if you're, if you're looking at NoSQL databases and uh, Azure in particular. All right, so let's talk about APIs a little bit. Um, and APIs are something that we kind of cover already with the server portion of this talk, but they have some special considerations because if you don't do your API correctly on the server side, it can really add a lot to the amount that you need to worry about scalability, et cetera. So uh, one of the first things I want to stress for you is you need to worry about rate limiting. Um, so with rate limiting, you need to limit the amount of times that your API can get called um, by somebody in a given second. Uh, so if I've got a, an application, I, I might only want to allow 100 requests from a given user in a given minute. 
Um, this is sort of a defensive move that you do to protect your server against denial of service attacks and against accidental denial of service attacks. It looks like uh, Nasser had one about, is there a formula or rule of thumb to help identify when to share the database? When they shard it? Uh, I would say when you start to encounter performance issues that you can't easily resolve. Um, if you're hitting sustained growth and your queries are getting slower and slower and slower due to the number of rows and you're running out of options, um, that's when you start thinking about more advanced database uh, solutions would be my advice to you. And then uh, the next one was, what is the efficiency of supporting all types? Um, inefficiency? Oh, the, in, in, inefficiency, yeah, sorry, inefficiency, my bad. Um, so Cosmos DB, they they get around that by making you pick one when you're creating it. And so that's how I think they get around any potential inefficiencies there. So if you if you realize you made a mistake, you need to actually create another Cosmos DB instance and then migrate your data. Um, the main draw drawback with Cosmos is its price. Uh, because it really is geo-replicable. Um, it, 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 you can just automatically replicate your data over, over to another data center or across the, the globe, et cetera. Uh, it does get a little bit more complex because you start to have to think about uh, different kinds of consistency models. So when somebody does a read, they may not be reading the most complete version of your data, um, but they have options to get around that as well, but you have to pay for them. Uh, and they have performance limitations too. Uh, if you go that route. Cosmos is an interesting database, but it can be expensive and you need to do your research if you're really going down that road. Um, good questions. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about rate limiting uh, as I interrupted myself there. Um, so I have a story about rate limiting. Um, you need rate limiting before you think you do. Uh, we did not think that we were going to get, get uh, targeted by a denial of service attack at one of my uh, past organizations. Um, and technically we didn't, uh, but we had a user who said, hey, I really like your dashboard. I really wish it refreshed more often. And so he went and he wrote a JavaScript plugin for his browser that auto refreshes the page. Cool, I like, it. I like people making you know, enterprising decisions and things like that. The problem was he, he made a mistake. Um, he forgot to give a parameter to the set interval function in JavaScript, and that I believe defaulted the parameter's value to zero. So every millisecond, his browser was making a request to our, our server. Uh, and with that, it was, uh, it was trying to fulfill that request, and it was not having a good time about it. Um, so his, his legitimate requests were actually bringing down our application entirely, uh, which was just, uh, brutal. We got around it by uh, adding rate limiting uh, after we after we blocked his IP <laughs> uh, and then and then communicated what went wrong to him and and had them restore service. Um, but we were able to get around this uh, later on by adding uh, rate limiting. So with rate limiting, uh, once you add a couple uh, requests, uh, once you have too many requests in a given second, uh, the server spits back. Hey, 429. You spent you, you sent me too many requests. This is when you can give me another request. And you typically rate limit either by IP address or by the user's authentication token. So this user is only allowed to do 100 calls in a second. So next thing I would I would be concerned about is is caching. So with caching, uh, we want to make a request to the uh, whenever a request comes into a server, the server will take that request. Um, and it'll check its cache. So the cache is usually an in-memory thing or something external like Redis, and it says, hey, do you have this resource that we requested? No? Uh, okay, well, I'll ask the, the database for it. So let's say somebody's asking for a list of, uh, of burritos, uh, and, and it, finds, uh, it, it finds the list, it pulls it back, and it puts it into the cache. And so the next time a request comes in, uh, somebody else is looking for that same piece of data and it checks the cache and says, hey, do you have the list of, of burritos? It says, oh yeah, I do, they're right here. And it takes them and it spits it out and it puts and it, and it spits out the response. So we didn't call the database at all. Um, additionally, the request took less time, so the app server spent less time worrying about the request and waiting for the, the database server. So if you cache some things that are highly uh, highly frequently used, 
um, it improves your application service performance and it drastically improves your database service performance. So uh, caching is usually a really good thing to do. It makes your application more complex because when something gets updated, you have to update it in the cache and in the database um, because not all servers always share the same caches. And so that, that can be a tricky thing. Uh, so you can have a lot more bugs with cache, caching, but it can also reduce your need to, to worry about scale uh, earlier on. Um, another thing to think about, uh, you want to worry about uh, a mistake that a lot of people make early on is if you're building something like a LinkedIn uh, style bell or a Twitter style bell that says, hey, do we have any new no notifications? Um, one of the things that, that you tend to do early on is you say, okay, I'm gonna make a request out to the server, see if I have any new resources. Um, if I do, it's gonna spit them back out. Um, uh, otherwise, it's, it's gonna say no. And so we, we check every 15 seconds or something just to see if we don't wanna light a bell or display a chat message or something like that. The problem is this really, uh, this really, uh, adds a lot to the load on the server. If you've got 100 people asking the server for more data every 15 uh, seconds, right? Uh, and so with that, uh, with this, 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 this type of a model, you have a big performance issue uh, over time. I've actually seen people, you know, people leave their desks and the browser window is still open. It's still making these requests out to the server. And you'll see 50 requests per minute coming in uh, well into the to the the evening hours, um, and so this 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 is a, an expensive mistake to make. Instead, what I would recommend is you use something like Signal R uh, that uses a WebSocket kind of a connection, where a client makes a request to the server, it opens the connection, and then it just says, "Okay, I don't have any data for you, but as soon as something new comes in, I'm going to send you a message, and you'll know about it." So instead of the client asking the server for things, the server tells the client, "Hey, you've got more data." Um, this really drastically can improve your performance, but it's a lot um, more technically involved. So it's a larger development time up front. A few more things can go wrong, uh, but it's usually worth it in terms of scalability. Um, another thing that you can look at is GraphQL. GraphQL is sort of like a, a query language for APIs. Uh, with GraphQL, uh, the user, the the caller will send some sort of a query, and that query will say, hey, I want you to give me this particular user. I want to have projects and names on that on that entity on each project. Don't give me all the data. I just want the name, the ID, maybe some other entities. So you can make one kind of a complex call to get exactly the data your application needs. Instead of having to make about 50 different calls, you're making one call for exactly what you need. And if you decide later on that you want another attribute on your users and the, and the server already has it, you alter your query. You don't have to do another update to the server. You don't have to add another API endpoint. You're just altering your GraphQL query. So really cool stuff. Uh, another thing that can help with, um, with API performance is by using gRPC. Uh, gRPC is a uh, technology that uses uh, kind of uh, uh, compression uh, and and it, it uses like this burst stream kind of a thing so you can stream binary data between the client and the server in a manner that's really resistant to uh, introducing issues when you expand your server uh, when, when you change your API uh, so gRPC is something to introduce if you if you control both the client and the server uh, this is really good if you're communicating from one server to another via an API um, gRPC tends to be really, really fast uh, because it's using binary data, but it's harder for other people to use your APIs with uh, versus something like REST or SOAP. Um, so our lovely Beretic keeps growing. Uh, it's thriving somehow. It's now the world's most leading burritos as a service organization because apparently someone decided that's a thing. Uh, users in the States are really happy, but people overseas are not. Uh, and so you need to start thinking about your applications performance at a global scale uh, by looking at the front end. Typically, these issues in performance are due to lag or latency. 
Uh, so while I might be fine making a connection uh, to, to a data center off on the West Coast uh, from over in Michigan, it might be a lot longer uh, to make that same request from India or Australia or the UK. Um, and so there's a few different ways you can, you can resolve this. The first way is to rely on minification to take your JavaScript and your CSS and keep them in the same effective state but make them as dense as possible through, through a process called minification. With minification, we're removing any sort of spacing. We are removing, we're renaming things to the smallest form they can have. Um, and we're removing, removing line breaks. This is something that happens typically automatically by some sort of a build tool. And this will uh, effectively minify things down to one, one small single line, or well, well potentially very really wide single line. But, you wouldn't think that this is making a difference, but on a large application, it makes a huge difference, which is crazy. Uh, so typically when you're making your production builds, your developers are still able to work with your full source code, but the shipped source code is this minified version, um, which costs less to, in terms of time to, to send across the world. The other thing you do is you work with content delivery networks or CDNs uh, to have sort of a local copy of things. So a user over in Europe is talking to a data center in Europe, which is giving the cached version of your actual content. Um, CDNs are a service you pay for, usually Cloudflare or something else uh, is gonna be your CDN. Uh, Azure has a CDN as well. Um, and when you push a new version of your, of your page or your HTML or CSS or JavaScript, it can take a little bit of time to propagate from uh, caching node to cache node but eventually everybody else will have the same, the updated CSS or logo or whatever it might be that you have cached. But this is usually a very good way of getting your content out there to the rest of the world. Uh, and there are ways of invalidating the cache so, so you can, it will know to pull um, a more recent version as well. Um, another consideration that you, you might need to worry about, is like, well, we can download the files easy because it's, it's a CDN near us but it still is making API calls to our server or our servers running back in the States. And so the API is now slow. The solution to that is to introduce edge servers. So your, your application is no longer a single data, it's a, a single data center. It's now running in data centers throughout the world and the users are connecting to the one nearest to them. Uh, this introduces a whole lot more complexity with sharing data uh, than we can really get into here. Um, but this introduces a whole lot more price as well. The upside is that your application is now globally available and it's got a lot more redundancy built in and people are having a better time of things. You're not really gonna have to worry about something like this unless you're at a really large scale, however. Um, Beretta is doing great. I still don't know how or why, um, but it's, it's growing, it's thriving, and people are loving it. And now we need to look at some more advanced concepts. So let's talk a little bit more about databases. I, I, I touched on it earlier with query performance, um, but one of the things that makes relatal, relational databases slow is something called locking. With a, data, with a relational database, whenever we're doing an update or an insert, or, or, well, an update operation typically, we typically lock a row for editing. So if I'm updating an entry and somebody else is trying to update that entry, they have to wait for me to be done. And if we have a lot of people querying the same table in the same rows all the time, it doesn't matter how fast my database is, we still gotta wait in line to own that lock and have access to that uh, row. And locks aren't just at the, at the row level. Sometimes we might lock a page of data or even an entire table or even the entire database. But typically those last two are when you're altering the database in some form, like you're adding a new column or a new table. Uh, so a lot of performance issues come from locking. And so this new thing called event sourcing has come around to try to get around this idea of, of locking. And with event sourcing, it says, why are we updating at all? Why can't we just insert an event into our database? So adding a new uh, comment on, a, on an item. And if we want to edit it at some point, we'll just add an edit event. So instead of updating the original, we're adding another event that says, hey, that, that event from earlier, yeah, I'm editing it now. 
and then you might edit that again. And so you'd have three events related to the same entity. And when anybody wanted to query the database and get that entity out, the query would return all events related to that. And you'd have some form of code that sort of lays them out in order one after the other to kind of rehydrate it or, or figure out the, the, the calculated state of this. Uh, the disadvantages of this is you have a lot of rows. The advantage of this is that you don't have to worry about locking anymore. Um, so event sourcing is interesting. It's 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 kind of cool in that regard, but you're going to have a really tall database, uh, which is which makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, but I'm not a database administrator. Um, a, a, a more acceptable solution, or a more a solution I'm more comfortable with, is something called a read replica. Uh, a read replica is where your database you have one database that you you can still write to. And your, your main application is querying that database. And this read this database synchronizes in near real time to a read replica. And this read replica has uh, has data in it that's that's somewhat um, it's somewhat uh, somewhat accurate. It's usually uh, accurate within a minute or so. Um, it depends on your database technologies and the read replica. But if you don't need data that's completely accurate you can rely on the read replica, and that takes less off of your main database. So that's sort of the idea behind a read replica. Hey, Matt, we have a quick question. Is that okay to ask right now? Or? Oh, please. With that, um, you are talking a minute ago about the event sourcing. Is there a background process to help flatten the database as um, time is available in event sourcing, like related to that? Or? Uh, say, it, say it again, I'm sorry. Is there a background process to flatten the database as time is available in event sourcing? Uh, I'm not certain. Uh, I, I, I could probably find a couple of book recommendations for you, um, but a lot of that is is actually leading up to some to, to my next slide. So I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but I like the question. Uh, sorry, it's an incomplete answer. No problem. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah. Um, so event sourcing is often used in tandem with something called CQRS or Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Um, I kind of hate the name because it's so long, but it's actually a pretty good name for it. With CQRS, uh, it doesn't have to be used with event sourcing, but it often is. We separate out write operations from read operations. So when it, when the UI needs to, to, to get data, it talks to the query service, which talks to a query database. When we want to update data or write data, we talk to the command service, which writes to the database. And typically, there's some sort of a background process here or some sort of a read replica operation that synchronizes these two databases together. And usually it'll transform the data. So it, it will take all those, those events and stack them on top of one another and write it to a view here that the query service can query. So it's not having to do a whole lot of joins at all with this database, it's just grabbing what it needs to display. So uh, in, this, in this case, there's almost always some sort of a, a background process happening um, that takes these events and applies them to to this database as well. So uh, this is this is getting into to more and more complex territory, but this is a really exciting development that that I've seen occur in recent years. Um, trying to get around some of the the bugs you might see in caching and um, trying to take advantage of event sourcing and things like that, or advantage of read replicas. Um, you have two databases. But locking is no longer a concern when you're reading because nothing is writing to this really. You're just periodically updating this database or recreating it, which is really cool. Um, another really cool new development is something called domain-driven design. I, I hate to say new because it, it first came around in the early 2000s, but we're discovering it again in, in a different context recently. Um, we'll talk more about that context in a second. But with domain-driven design, it talks about a lot of the little things but one of the things it talks about is identifying related pieces of data. Uh, with related pieces of data, uh, we identify something that we call an aggregate root. Um, and that is one piece of data that other things are related around. And we sort of structure our application around these concepts. Uh, so I might have classes related to, to, to looking at things from a customer perspective and classes related to looking at things from a product perspective. And this data is, is, is very loosely tied together. So I can structure my code around this. But I can structure my data around it too, which is cool. 
And with domain-driven design, we can take our data and say, well, wait a minute, I don't need one big database. I can take two databases. So I can take my large database here and I can split it into two different databases. Uh, and I can maybe use NoSQL for one and a relational database for the other. Um, and that's really cool. And this gives us almost a different form of partitioning or sharding. Um, so that's one of the advantages of domain-driven design. Um, but if you if you think about this and you're like, well, wait a minute, I got my logic separated for my customer's logic here, my logic separated for my product logic here, I get two databases. Well, why can't I just separate these out? Why why can't I just have a customer service and a product service? And so you see this this domain-driven design concept, it sort of tends itself towards these little services, which we call microservices. And with a microservice kind of a solution, you would have a lot of these little services that exist independently of one another or fairly independently of one another. And they exist in isolation. They can be running whatever technologies they want to run, Node.js, ASP.NET, uh, Java, wh whatever you wanted to run on each one, whatever each team is responsible for. Or it wants to use uh, for their particular thing. They can use whatever database technologies they want to use that the organization is okay with. Um, this microservice type of an architecture, it takes, it, it helps organizations scale up as they get more and more people on their teams. So you no longer have a lot of people working in the same area. Now you have people working over here and people working over here and people working over here. And that's the main advantage of microservices is they keep really small replaceable things that an individual team or an individual can focus on. The disadvantages is it becomes harder for you to think about your system as a whole because harder for you to understand the flow of things from beginning to end. Um, that's the main disadvantage of microservices. Your application becomes more and more complex. You need to have a larger degree of maturity in terms of uh, automating deployment, automating testing, um, monitoring your applications. All these things become a lot harder. There are solutions for all these things, but you need a certain level of maturity. So unless you're at a certain level of maturity where you have people stepping on each other all the time trying to, to, to work with the same code, it might not make sense to, to work with microservices because the cost of using them is so high in terms of overhead, complexity, automation, uh, tooling, uh, a lot of these tools are can be expensive. Um, additionally, with microservices, you have to worry a little bit more about availability because if one service can't talk to the other one, well, now your service needs to, to worry about that. It needs to have some sort of a strategy for handling a failure. If a database is offline, how do we handle that? Can we still build a customer for something that we're not shipping to them? You know, how how do how do we handle this? Um, this, there is a solution for that. The solution for that is typically to switch from a, a model where one microservice calls to the other one, like I have here in this picture, and instead you switch towards what we call an event-driven architecture, where different microservices will publish an event to something called an event broker. On Azure, this would be a, a service bus or something like that. Uh, and you'd have different services publish their own events. And other services, would subscribe to these. So you have a publish subscribe model or a pub sub model, it's sometimes called. And each one of these things will say, well, hey, I'm interested in this event. I'm going to subscribe to it. Send it to me. Right? So the billing uh, microservice might be interested in a shopping transaction. The logging uh, service is interested in it. The inventory service is interested in it. So each one of these things subscribes to it. And each one of these typically will have a queue, some sort of a message queue. So when an event occurs, it gets added to the queue of anything that's subscribed to it. And if this billing service is overloaded and it can't receive the event or it's offline, that's fine. When it comes back up, it'll pull it from the queue. So these queues add an, an additional level of hardening uh, for if things go offline. They offer a bit of scalability for if one thing is overloaded. In microservices, you can scale each one vertically or horizontally. There's a whole lot of the same scalability concepts I've been talking about all day. Um, but they apply to the individual ones. So the logging microservice might not need to scale, but the shopping service might. Um, and we can handle that independently, which is really cool. Um, so in conclusion, uh, let's take a look at, at, at all of this uh, at a higher level. 
a lot of the stuff is really cool, really fun to think about, really interesting. And you might be asking yourself how to get started. If you want to get started with some of the stuff, the first thing I would suggest you do is, if you're not already using cloud technologies, look at Azure, because I think it's it's easy to learn from a, a .NET perspective. If you're familiar with Visual Studio, if you're familiar with the tooling there, it offers a 12-month uh, free account. Um, it offers a $200 credit for your first month as well, if you want to use paid services during that time. But you can take advantage of the 12-month free account um, and and, uh, and set up an environment and play around with it, which is really cool. Um, the other thing is that Microsoft also offers a whole lot of uh, really good content around uh, Microsoft Learn in the form of little articles and courses and, and learning paths, guided paths for learning specific things. Um, so that's uh, Microsoft Learn, and then you can do a search for Azure, free Azure, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty high up there on, on how to get started with that. I do want to give you a word of warning, though. Um, you need to, to take advantage of, of Azure cost analysis, which is free, but it lets you take a look at your ongoing payments. It lets you set up alerts for if you suddenly start going over budget. Um, it's really important that you do that because there's a lot of options on these things. And if you're playing with them for the first time, you may not realize which things are gonna cost you a lot of money. Uh, so be very careful. I actually had a student last fall uh, accidentally choose the wrong type of database and he wound up with a $300 bill at the end of the month instead of what we thought might be a $30 bill. Uh, thankfully, Microsoft is awesome and they actually waived that fee for him, which I didn't think they would do. Um, but you may not be as lucky. So pay attention to Azure cost analysis and Azure cost alerts um, and just be proactive there. But the number one takeaway I want you to think about with some of these more advanced things is that all of these technologies all let you do about the same thing, right? Use the one that makes sense for you. If you're just serving up maybe two concurrent users, <laughs> stay small. If you're Netflix, go for microservices, you know, go for edge, edge nodes. Um, pick whichever one you have the capacity to pay for uh, in terms of your team's time, in terms of complexity, in terms of everything else. Because each one of these has a cost, but they allow you to hit higher and higher tiers of usage. So my recommendations are early on, scale up your server as, you, as soon as you start to hit issues, minify your JavaScript, take advantage of a CDN. Um, and then once you start having database issues, optimize those queries, pay attention to your indexes on an ongoing basis. Once you really start to hit sustained growth, you need to start looking at scaling out. Uh, you really probably at that point should be doing rate limiting, even if you think you shouldn't, even if your business thinks it's not important, you really should. Um, and you should be caching some of the most important things to buy yourself a little bit more time. But do that once you're ready to handle the bugs that may come with it. You also need to be start planning ahead about how your database is gonna be uh, handling at larger scales. So if you get 10 times as many users, how is your application gonna handle it? You need to start thinking about that. At the higher levels, you're looking at microservices, you're looking at automation and maturity, you're looking at NoSQL, database partitioning, things like that. Uh, finally, some recommended reading. Uh, I mentioned the NoSQL book, I don't have a slide for it. Uh, I would recommend that you take a look at the Fundamentals of Software Architecture by Mark Richards and, and Neil Ford. And actually everything from the White O'Reilly series is really, really good. It tends to be more advanced, but if you find one of those books that's really interesting to you, uh, go and buy it because they're all really good. Um, I recommend Web Scalability for Startup Engineers. This is more of a start to finish kind of a thing. Um, it, it tends to be maybe more on the advanced side, but it's a good comprehensive all-in-one book. Uh, the other uh, book I would recommend is the one I'm working on, uh, which is more intended for um, newer developers, non-technical professionals, intermediate developers. It's really a lot of the stuff from this talk, but at a deeper level. Um, that's looking to come out this fall. Uh, you can subscribe to that at uh, newdevsguide.com or follow me on Twitter and I'll be blasting it there too, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, finally, if you are looking to learn, if you know somebody who's looking to learn, if you're looking to hire, um, check out Tech Elevator. We have students across the globe, uh, including in Michigan, who uh, are really learning a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, we screen our applicants really heavily, and so we're very proud of all of our graduates. So here's uh, Rita Stahl's contact information. She's our National Live Remote uh, Campus Director, and she can also get you uh, put in touch with, with Michigan-specific uh, uh, opportunities. 
and finally, even though my camera's off, I'm still Matt. Uh, you can follow me on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Uh, I'd be happy to connect you with, with more steps to, to learn uh, if you have questions after, after this. Um, but what questions do we have? And hey, look at that. I have a camera. Yay. Maybe. What was that form? Well, not not form, but book. That very first book you recommended near the end just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're talking about fundamentals of software architecture, right? All right. Yeah. 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 This is this that is one. a this is a good one. Um, it gets into the weeds sometimes, but it's really good for looking at different types of architectures. Uh, it talks a lot about MVC and uh, some alternatives to that. Um, it's really good for broadening your architectural horizon from a code perspective. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I do apologize for the camera issues as well. <clears throat> you know, just more of a, you know, come on, you brought some great, <clears throat> you know, things like the locking the database stuff. I definitely ran to, to that. So I appreciate, mm. you know, educating because that's the thing. I have gone into microservices for there, but I can give you a word of caution and other things is that, and you brought it up there too, I think is the domain driven design is really important because it's easy to get microservices, not so micro, if you mm. uh, are careful. <laughs> and then instead of having like these databases that are tied to your microservice, that's um, very specific, you end up duplicating data a lot because you care about events that happen to other services, you end up like, duplicating your database across, you know, 20 different surfaces. And, but, um, so I think it comes with like, a, you know, a lot of like expecting it. I, th I think like we have to expect that we're going to fail at things and yep. you learn from failures, you know? So, so I think yep. I, I don't want to say don't go and get into it, but just expect that you're going to run into some challenges. You're going to learn a lot. And then when you, um, you know, learn those things, you'll, you'll, you'll do a lot better, you know, that's my, my take on it. But, yeah. Hey, this is Joe. I want to add something. Uh, you, you mentioned locking in the database. Um, I have worked with an organization where it's common for them in their applications to add the no lock hint into their queries. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does speed things up because they're, you know, they're saying, I don't care about locks, just give me the data. The yeah. problem is you can have inconsistent data. You could actually grab uh, a table that's half updated and only get half of the updates. So locking, for, locking is a feature. It's not a flaw. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, not something to avoid. So, um, I, you know, for those of you who haven't, you know, encountered that, I just wanted to bring forward that, you know, at, at first glance, it sounds great. Just turn off all the locks and give me the data. That's all I care. I'm only reading it. You know, that's fine. But it turns out it's not fine. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something you need to start thinking about with the NoSQL things and things that use eventual consistency models is because you can run into these issues where the data you're reading may not be the last data that was actually written to the database, which is weird um, and all flavors of bugs can come from that yeah can uh, data consist you, you right you have a lot of flexibility in the NoSQL databases but you give up immediate consistency hmm. however we, we we have used those in some of our projects um, at, at Dewpoint uh, the NoSQL databases and you know we were working with uh, genetic information and the, the data was just so huge that, you know, SQL would have just, you know, gone crazy. Um, and and, and we, we had to go to a NoSQL in order to handle that kind of volume of data. I heard a, um, a presentation uh, when I was in school, I remember it, it's been a little while, but it was the, um, the, it was called like the case for D, for, 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 I can't remember exactly the name, it was something like not normalizing data. Mm. That's what yeah. I kind of think of like NoSQL in some ways, but it was just this idea that, you know, the relations and things that you have there cause a lot of problems. And um, it was pretty cool, like discussion from a guy who had to handle things at scale. Um, yeah. About how he said the cost of duplicating wasn't bad. <laughs> you know, it was interesting. You mean denormalization? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you take your data, you, you write the, the view that people are going to be actually be querying to, and it, it frees things up. And it, you do have to worry about, you know, when is that update? But uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's remarkably good for performance. Yeah, this wasn't um, CQRS at the time, but I, I'm sure it existed. But he didn't talk about that. But it, but a very similar kind of concept in a way because it was just saying, 
it was similar to what this is and saying, what does the user interface need? Make yeah. the make the view exactly what they wanted, you know, and and that's what CQRS is cool with event sourcing that you're storing with those events just to keep track of it, and then that's not an efficient read model though, and so then you can use these projections and um, and make you know your data just what the user needs, um, which is which is really powerful, but um, you know, but 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 complex I think in some ways because it's just kind of like you mentioned this is new, even though I imagine it's been around for quite a few years, it's just not really yeah. popular. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, difficult to find people that are experiencing it. My my main my main point where I want to understand more with CQRS is when do you adopt it, right? Because if you're a brand new organization, you probably don't have time to worry about this level of complexity. So at what point do you bite the bullet and rewrite or restructure things in such a way that you're using a CQRS architecture? And is it possible to use that with event sourcing if you didn't start out that way? And, and if, if not, you, if so, what are the drawbacks to it? You know, So th these are some of the puzzle pieces I'm, I'm still looking at with CQRS and event sourcing, but they're cool technologies. Everything's got got uh, trade-offs. That's uh, software development for you. Yeah, I was, I was gonna, I'm gonna try to find a link and post it. There was like a guy sent me one today about how to transition from um, a state model, a state-based model, to event sourcing. Yeah. And uh, so there are strategies and things like that. Obviously, you can kind of get there, but <clears throat> I can tell you that part, you know, the organization I work with has gone like this route of CQRS without event sourcing. And um, it causes some pain points because you really think about like if you're doing some kind of feature to add uh, a new field, it means not changing it in one place, but changing it in like three places essentially. Yeah. You know, because you have to do the saving to the database, you have to do the projection, the uh, event that goes to the right, the read side, and then you got to do the read. So yep. it, it doesn't necessarily save you time, but the premise being that you're handling for this, you know, reliability and scale and stuff like that. And and sometimes if you don't know that that exists, it's like why why are we doing this even? You know, right? That's the, the challenge. And, and yeah, you mentioned I'm like, uh, event sourcing and schema, and actually the that's one of the benefits of event sourcing when you use it in kind of the intended way is that you don't care about schema, right? Mm. You you can just throw whatever messages you want. And if you have more information to provide, you just throw it onto the event queue and the things that care about it will adjust. You know, the subscribers that care will all of a sudden be storing that extra information or using that extra information. Uh, but it depends on how you do it. But the way that I've seen it, you know, where you transition from, you know, a more traditional relational database to now you want to have an event stream going on uh, alongside that is you set up something like your CDC triggers, your change data capture, and you have your existing kind of legacy database of sorts. You have that spitting CDC changes you know, into a queue, and then you also have your newer stuff going directly to that same queue, and then you have a further downstream model that might be your destination as you slowly change things out where they're not using that you know, monolithic database that you were using in the past. Yeah, that's what I love talking talking to folks because uh, I'm learning stuff. You know, this is great. <laughs> so, um, also on the the NoSQL, um, back to that. So, if you have a natural primary key in your data that you're primarily storing in your NoSQL, if the, if 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 the in our case again, it was the size of the data, not necessarily that that it was so dynamic. Yeah. Um, and so what we fell upon, and I've seen this work in, in actually several instances, uh, a hybrid model. So we had SQL Server basically manage all the primary keys, and we would initially find things uh, through the primary keys. And then once we had the, and that would map directly into, you know, uh, the row in the NoSQL database. So we basically put a, a head front end on the NoSQL uh, with all our keys and indexes via SQL uh, Server. Mm. That's cool. This is the nice thing about software development is you're never bored. There's always something to learn. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so I mean, just point out that that actually, you know, so. <laughs> just, I'm just going to point out that it actually worked very well for us. So yeah, cool. Uh, there's a question I always like to ask when I'm talking uh, to folks, um, and that's is is anyone here working on anything cool that they'd be interested in, in, in talking about with the group? Because I, I always love seeing the stuff that people build or hearing about it anyway. 
can you ask a little bit? I mean, I'm not sure what you mean. Something that we're like a personal pet project or yes. something professional that we've run across? From, or? A, from a side project perspective, they'd be willing to share about? I, was say, I really enjoyed the, um, and you can see this on my stream. I actually made a web application to help run my stream. And it talks to Lee Chess API, pulls back player data. Every month mm -hmm. I update all the players' data to show them uh, the top five at all rating categories for gaining points for the month. But I actually call it to Lee Chess, bring it back. Then I go to SQL Server on my end and run some queries to show that uh, leading people and such. I also created a, a games on that website, like a, a bracket tournament where I can get people to uh, essentially get assigned. Then I open up four screens. I have all, you know, all four players for the some, uh, what is it, the quarterfinals, semifinals, and then final game. Like, it's a lot of fun. That web app is doing a lot of things for my stream right now. I, I can't mm -hmm. share the code because it's too close to what I do at work. Oh, but sure. it's, all, um, it's all hosted locally, and you can see it all working on stream every night. So it's really cool to have that. It's been really yeah, that's fun. That's cool. Yeah, I just I, I love hearing the things that people build with code. You know, it's it's one of the things I love is is seeing people build stuff they love. Well, folks, thanks for having me. Uh, sorry for the the issues with the the dog and the the camera. Uh, it is a Thursday, uh, but uh, I, I enjoyed uh, speaking to you all. No, great presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Matt. We appreciate it. So the link is in the chat for the feedback survey. If you could provide some feedback for Matt, we would greatly appreciate that. That will be open for about 24 hours. So tomorrow evening, that'll close for responses. And I will also email that link out as well if you happen to miss it. Okay, we, we can, we, even though we're virtual, we can still applaud. Good job. <laughs> All right, thank you, Matt. And thank you again, Matt. That was wonderful.